My name is Melba Pearson. I am proud to serve as the Deputy Director of the ACLU of Florida, and I'm also the co-chair of the Prosecution Function Committee for the ABA. And this is our re-entry and innovation panel. Um, so re-entry has definitely been a concern in recent years in trying to figure out ways we can be more effective in bringing folks who are returning citizens, what, either from prison or entering the criminal justice system and trying to get their lives back on track. How do we do that? That effectively and how can we use technology to do this effectively so I've gathered a panel of experts who can tell us some very interesting things that they are doing um, in this field so I'm going to start with Alex Blau who was at the end uh, Josh, Judge Scott Schlegel who is next to me here on my side over here is Linda Faye Matthews, and at the end over here is Jacob Sills. I'm going to allow them to speak for about a minute or so to give a brief introduction. The bios are in your materials. I know you guys are all capable of reading them, but I always love to bring bios to life by having the person who has actually lived the experience talk about what's most important to them. So I will start with you. Thank you, Melba. Hey everybody, um, my name is Alex Blau, I'm a Vice President for an organization called Ideas42. Um, Ideas42 is a behavioral design nonprofit, so we use insights from behavioral economics and experimental psychology to help organizations, governments design products and services and programs uh, that take into account how humans actually act and decide as opposed to the way that we generally think that they do. Uh, so getting rid of the, the rational actor model and supplanting it with something that's a little bit more human. Um, and so right now I'm actually working on developing an intervention uh, called Virgil, uh, which helps individuals coming off a period of incarceration or those uh, under community supervision to identify programs and services that they can connect with and help them to deal with some of the implementation challenges and following through. So it involves a lot of plan making, setting commitments and goals, um, and then also implementation support in process. So things like reminders, uh, just in time check-ins, and other sorts of uh, delivered interventions uh, to support individuals. Thank you, Alex. Linda. Actually, my name is Linda Faye Matthews, and I coordinate and provide services to men and women who return to Jefferson Parish for the Reentry Club program. I have the best job in America. Let <laughs> me just say. So um, it's really awesome to be able to be active in transformation of a person's life, a person who is considered high risk, high, risk, high need according to the court system, and to have those persons to say, I'm motivated enough that I want to change my life, and to have a court and a team who's willing to be with them not only before incarceration but during incarceration and when they return. We have a team approach where uh, every Wednesday they come to court just about and they're able to have a conversation with the judge and they're able to talk to the team during the week. We have uh, resources and um, support systems that we've developed and uh, built in that help them to implement what they've learned during the incarceration phase. It's one thing to get new information while you're incarcerated. It's another thing when you come home to be able to implement that information and incorporate it into your life where it makes a difference. And we don't just deal with the individual, but we actually have a team of counselors who will work with family members while the person is incarcerated. So what is it for a person to get healthy and return to the community and the family is still suffering? And so we have that component if the family takes advantage of it. And so I could go on and on and on. I think it's a really awesome program. We have 18 people who have returned. We have about 41 that are still incarcerated. And we look forward to them coming home. So what's different is when they come home, we celebrate. We actually stand up and clap. And um, we welcome them back to the community. And we provide them with um, different resources to be with them. So it's really exciting. And uh, like I said, I could go on and on, but every day, it's a good day. Awesome. Thank you, Linda. Judge, I can't break the habit. All right. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Scott Schlegel. I'm a trial court judge in Louisiana, Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. It borders Orleans Parish. Uh, we have to reimagine the criminal justice system. Uh, everybody here understands and appreciates the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, I think the statistics in 2015 were 4.7 million people under correctional supervision. That's one in 55 adults. Uh, with a um, BJS just came out with their nine year study. Mm -hmm. I think it was 67% after year three, 73% after year five, and the nine year rate was 83%. Uh, in the state of Louisiana, 59% of all new admissions to the Department of Corrections is based upon revocations from probation and parole. 
we have to reimagine the criminal justice system. And I always say holding somebody accountable and caring about them are not mutually exclusive. So what do we do, what are we going to do about it to enable these individuals to actually have a real opportunity to succeed, to get healthy so that there are no more victims? And so what we have created in Jefferson Parish is a Smart on Crime initiative, and we have two smart supervision um, programs. One is run by Ms. Linda Faye Matthews, who I can't give you a raise because of that comment. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Ms. Linda Fay is a licensed professional counselor. Uh, she is a former probation and parole officer and uh, brings a wealth of knowledge and we're glad to have her on our team. She is our coordinator for a program where we send short timers, what I say short time, folks with long rap sheets uh, that are sentenced to 10 years or less, non-violent, <coughs> non-sex offenders, we send them to Angola prison where they live with lifers. Uh, these lifers would go home tomorrow if they were allowed, but they say, look, this is my way of giving back to the communities that I once terrorized. And this is their words. And they pour into these individuals and work with them in their soft skills. And they also work with them in hard skills. So they actually learn a trade. There's 14 different vocations at Angola Prison where they can become an ASC certified mechanic, a welder, a horticulturist. And then they can petition the court to re-enter society after about two years. And then they come back home. We have one returning next Wednesday. And we will all stand up and congratulate him for his efforts and welcome him home. <laughs> Uh, and he will now have a trade so that he can actually earn a livable wage and actually have an opportunity. Um, and so we, that's one of our programs. And one is the Swift and Certain Probation model where we are taking high-risk probationers uh, or those that have multiple felony convictions. And this is the, we don't want to send you to jail. And this is an intensive incarceration program. And because we're here with the smart supervision, we layer technologies on top of it to make our jobs uh, more efficient so that we can actually respond to the needs of the individual in real time so that we can hopefully address what's going on before there's a new victim. Uh, so, you know, substance abuse is not typically just substance abuse. Typically, there's something that underlies that substance abuse. And so we utilize technologies to do that. We utilize technologies to cut down on failures to appear. So we send them text messages and emails so that just come to court. We're not trying to do anything other than address your issue. Um, so, again, I too could go on and on, but I'll wait for questions. Uh, I, you can spend less than $750 a year to reimagine the entire criminal justice system utilizing technologies, and I can tell you how, and I've written for the ABA, and there's a video from the ABA Center for Innovation if you want the 50-minute version. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'm, I'm Jacob Sells. I'm one of the co-founders of an organization, UpTrust. Um, so what UpTrust does is it reminds people of court and connects them to relevant uh, social services so they don't have technical violations such as FTAs. And we also um, saw how judges and prosecutors were often conflating attendance issues with flight risk. And as an outsider, it seemed a little crazy to me that most people who had a public defender who had no money were considered a flight risk when they probably hadn't ever left the county. And so with that, we really tried to think through how do you meet these needs? How do you help people show up with a higher rate so that they can make better decisions, um, see their case through disposition, but not end up on jail on bench warrants and things of that nature? Um, so we've launched UpTrust about two years ago in California. We're in about 15 different counties around the country. Um, we've seen our FTA rates in different counties drop from around 15 to 20% down from 5 to 8% in most places, which in some respects is a dramatic improvement, but we think we can do better in that the real failure to appear probably should be somewhere around two or three percent um, because most people aren't sort of a flight risk. Um, in terms of how it works, it's software that plugs in with county case management systems and utilizes public defenders and social service professionals so they can collect numbers and accurate numbers and send these right reminders. Um, as Judge Schlegel was saying, you know, look, like, this is not rocket science. You know, these are sort of simple tools that have been around that your doctors, your dentists, are using probably currently, but reformatting a little bit for the justice system. Um, you know, while a lot of our work has been done on pretrial, it does have a lot of applications um, to things like probation, parole, and reentry, and that making these appointments and, and, and staying on a better calendar is so critical to making sure you don't get gummed up in the system and end up on, you know, an issue that's maybe an issue related to poverty and behavioral change, not new criminality. Thank you. All right, so then I'm going to pivot back to you. Um, if you could talk about how you identified this need within the criminal justice system and kind of like how the process by which you started to work on yeah. this project. So um, one of the, the major tenets of behavioral science is that a lot of the behaviors and actions that we see people take uh, don't necessarily reflect their true intentions. Um, and in fact, what we generally see represents what we call an intention action gap. Um, one way to think about 
folks who are either coming out of the system or under the community supervision is that they're intentionally committing crimes, they're intentionally violating the, the terms of their, their supervision. Um, I can tell you that for the most part, that's probably not the case. And the reality is that they're facing a, con a context, an environment, which makes it a lot harder for them to be able to follow through on the things they're most interested in following through on. So if we start from that position, we can then start looking at the environment around them to try to look at what makes it hard to follow through. Um, it makes it so we're not really uh, in the position of trying to change the individual, but instead provide supports to the individual to navigate that context. Um, so that's really a lot of what we're focused on, um, recognizing that sometimes people just need help, not just being reminded about what they should do next, but help actually making that plan commitment around following through and being very concrete about what those steps are going to be. Um, even you know, small hassles in the environment can have a very, very large outside, outsized impact on outcomes for folks, uh, which is why things like Uptrust work very well, for instance. Um, but we're really trying to deal with this in a more comprehensive manner and actually remove uh, a lot of the imposition of uh, sort of downward pressure on individuals because we do believe very much that the vast majority of individuals who are either coming out of the system or who are continued to be in the system under supervision want to succeed. And that they, if given the right tools and given right opportunity, that they're going to follow through on their best intentions. They just need a little bit of help. Um, so that's a lot of what we're trying to build these days. Hey, so uh, please tell the ladies and gentlemen a little bit more about your project sure. and what, what it's been able to achieve at this juncture. Yeah, so we, we began this work um, actually in South Africa a number of years ago. Uh, we were working on a public safety project trying to reduce the incidence of crime and violence in some of the town uh, townships around Cape Town. Um, and we went in and we found some really interesting stuff. I mean, off the bat, we, we did a little bit of data analysis to just try to get a sense of a little bit more character around the nature of uh, both the crime and violence that we were seeing. And we saw two things of import. One was that a lot of these, uh, either the perpetration or the victims of these crimes, uh, were young, between the ages of about 16 and 26 years old. And we also found one other thing, which is that a lot of these incidences were very localized, both in time and in geography. And so we wanted to better understand how people were ending up in these positions, what actually got people to this place at this time that resulted in the outcome that we saw. And so we did some work to do interviews with folks, uh, both gang members in the community, people who had gotten out who had been at risk or in trouble before, to really understand you know, what is the nature of crime that you see and how do you make decisions about where you end up. And we learned two really important pieces. One was that a lot of the crime that we were seeing was actually quite opportunistic. It wasn't as though people were going into those environments intending to commit crime, but you can imagine that you know, if you're around strangers uh, in, under the cover of darkness, maybe fueled by drugs and alcohol, things can happen, and those things can result in some very, very bad outcomes. Uh, Jens Ludwig, who's a, a wonderful researcher up at the University of Chicago, says that most of the reasons why we see people incarcerated um, has to do with about 10, 10 seconds of bad decision making, <laughs> right? And if we take that into account, we can recognize how these really, really small things can trip people up. And so what we did is we tried to address this problem uh, by helping people to both identify alternatives uh, to these environments that they were going into, and then helping them to follow through by uh, committing them to plans that they would make for themselves. Uh, we intervened with a population of about 200 people, did this as an RCT, and what we found was that by giving people this tool, um, helping them to identify alternative diversions, and then helping them to make plans and commitments around it, um, this population was able to report incidents, self-reported incidences of crime and violence of themselves over the past seven days at a rate 30% lower than the control population. Um, so this was huge for us, and we wanted to fight, figure out a way of validating this. Um, so we took this to Chicago, and we tried to do a very similar intervention with youth in Chicago. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the uptake rate that we wanted, um, which, of course, is a challenge un into, un unto itself. Um, and I, I had to step back to try to figure out, well, what, what was the reason for this? And it's sort of straightforward, you can imagine. Um, I like to think of myself as maybe a kind of cool guy. Uh, the young kids in Chicago did not. Um, <laughs> and we did uh, ourselves a disservice, I think, by scraping uh, both the library services and the park services for activities that youth could take part in. Um, and as you can imagine, what youth's intention was, was not to identify strategies to stay safe, but just to find cool things to do with their friends. And so they had alternatives. They had substitutes in the form of, of Facebook and just learning about what was going on from their peers. And so they weren't going to use our service. But what it caused me to then think about was maybe there's another population who does have a very strong intention to actualize strategies that can keep them safe. And 
uh, it was about a year and a half ago that the district attorney's office in Manhattan sent out a series of RFPs around uh, re-entry re innovations, and it got me thinking about how the population that I was trying to serve was likely overlapping with this re-entry population in some way. And the key difference, in some sense, was that the folks who were coming back probably had a very strong intention to stay out, and they wanted to figure out strategies to, to do so. And the research that we've done, uh, both going into facility, talking to people in community, a lot of what I hear back from them is that they want to identify strategies to stay safe and that one of the things that we can do to help them is to keep them busy. And so one of the things that I recognize that I need to do if I need to keep busy is simply to just make plans and be very con concrete about them. We also recognize that this population has a set of needs that they know that they need to address or are being mandated to address by the court system. And helping them to follow through on those through plan making and commitments as well can help them to schedule up their time and stay out. But that we also need to provide them with alternatives when they have free time. So simply well-structured, good events and activities that are going on within their communities that they could take advantage of are things that we'd like to be able to insert in. Um, but the big key insight here is that if we can help people deal with these implementation challenges in their lives, finding transportation, dealing with the challenge of figuring out whether or not I can schedule a time to have this appointment, if I have a time that's earlier in the day, do I have enough transportation time to get there without failure, um, these small implementation steps are actually quite critical in just helping people follow through on their best intentions. And so we're now in the process of building this intervention, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to pilot it next year. Um, and that's, that's sort of a genesis of the idea and what I've been working on for, for the past year or so. Great, thank you. So, so I'd love for you guys to touch on that as well. Sure, so uh, again, what we're, really all we're doing is uh, building, not built, building. Um, we're trying to take everything that's already been developed in the private sector, everything that's already been developed in corporate America, <laughs> that's been spent millions and millions of dollars and just simply reimagining and repurposing the use of those. We talked about the dentist's office. That, you know, if you just forget about what your, your point of view, replace the word criminal with patient, all right? So if the individual is sick and needs to get healthy, uh, what do we do? So if you're sick, you call the doctor's office, you call the dentist's office, and what happens? Uh, by the time you've hung up, they've sent you a text or an email, you dump it on your calendar, I can't live, I have two phones on me, I don't know where I'm going without my phones. And so, by the time I get to the doctor's office, I've been pinged a couple times, and if you schedule a dentist, what is up with dentists? They hit you with text after text after text until you get there. And when you get there, they say, how are you, Mr. Schlegel? It's good to see you. I see you're here for a cold X, Y, and Z. And when you go behind the doctor's office, if you need to be in surgery, they push a button to get the right specialist in to get you healthy. And then there's an aftercare plan, and then they can follow the aftercare. And if you don't go to the pharmacy, somebody pings you, hey, come get your medication. From a societal perspective, the healthier we are, the healthier society is. So if you just look at that model and start taking from that model and from a communications platform, so we have multiple agencies. We have law enforcement, probation and parole, the courts, public defenders, DAs, counselors, third-party providers. We have an encrypted messaging platform that we use locally so that if and when there's a violation, we respond immediately to the violation so that we can respond to the needs of the individual so that they don't get sick or so that there aren't more victims. And so while I was in a meeting, I get a text or an encrypted messaging platform that somebody had tested positive. What do we do? Everybody's on it so there's no ex parte and we address it immediately. We don't wait until that person gets sicker and sicker and sicker and there's a, more, a new victim. So you're referring to the platform. So what, what we're trying to develop and build is if you have a substance abuse problem, maybe it's because of you were sexually abused or physically abused your whole life. So I want to get my counselors to say, all right, audio, video, text. Everybody's a different learner. Give me some articles by that you approve, and how many times does that person need to be touched? and prop up that video library and that digital library so that the individuals can get that product, go speak with the counselor, and we award points for everybody to earn your way off of probation. So I'll give you an extra point. If you read that article, talk to the counselor. That just increases and helps with the positive behavioral changes. So that's what we're trying to develop just by taking products off the shelf repurposing them for our purpose and you all use those products daily um, and it doesn't cost that much you know so that's what we're trying to build so um, in addition to that I would say um, we are doing it different in Jefferson Parish <laughs> and so yes um, 
using the technology is great, um, and we do that. Each person in the program has to have a smartphone. Each person has to have an email. All of that is great. Uh, I'm still a component of the human uh, contact and the human caring. Because think about it. This is a population that hasn't necessarily had the supports or people in their lives to give them positive reinforcement or people to give them the what a boy, what a girl. Um, and so it still helps to know that I have a person I can come to. I have a mentor. I have a sponsor if I need it. I have a judge that every Wednesday morning I can have a conversation. This is not a judge telling you, um, you didn't do this or you didn't do that, but actually having a conversation saying, how's your kids and how you doing this and, you know, and listening. So I just want to put that part out there because human caring is still very important. But in addition to that, the other resources actually really care. So there are pro bono attorneys, and lots of them, who are, have been gathered and they volunteer to connect with these persons when they return to say, you have this outstanding issue that should have been taken care of when you were incarcerated, but it hasn't been, and I'm gonna help you walk through this. And so some might say that's coddling, but I'm opposed to that term, and I to call it caring. <laughs> and people still need caring. Why do people go to the doctor? Some of them go because they don't have anybody and they want somebody there to tell them it's going to be all right. So I don't know if it's truth. You know, people could research it, but why are people staying in the criminal justice system? Is it just because they haven't had that uh, positive reinforcement or is it for another reason? I don't know. Um, in addition to that, one of the things I find on the front end is I do an assessment before a person comes into the uh, the system, and there's an assessment that's done when they go out of the system, well, when they return to the community. And one of the questions that um, has always been really interesting to me is to ask a person who's been in the criminal justice system forever, what are your strengths? And for that person not to have an answer. So if I asked anyone in this room, what are your strengths? Probably you could uh, regurgitate a lot of things. And so just something as simple as that, um, is a motivator, but it's also self-esteem. You know, what do you do well? And so if you did it in the criminal world, it's still a strength. And if you can translate that into something positive, it's a good thing, right? I think so. Anyway, um, and then motivation. Motivation is a big factor in the way this program has been successful. So um, I'm finding that age is important. Uh, because most of our participants in the reentry program are older. They're high risk, high needs, so they've been in it for a while. Now, in our partner program, Swift and Certain, um, age matters as well. We're finding that the group between 17 and 24, that's the group we're losing. We haven't been able to kind of tap into what's going on with them. They're the ones that tend to recidivate faster. They're the ones who tend to say, the hell with this, I'm not doing it. And they will revoke themselves. So um, age, is, age is a factor. So find an older person who's willing to say, you know, I'm an old OG, and I'm tired of doing that. I want to get out of the system, and this is a way for me to do it. Sure, I have to spend some time in prison, but I have the opportunity to actually save my own life and save the life of my family. Is that almost a no-brainer? Great. Can Thank I add two more? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Ride sharing. You know, I mean, we have people who are not on the right bus line. They don't have, you know, their car breaks down. They don't have the resources. Catch a ride sharing service. So we're about to start a pilot uh, next next month um, where if you have a real excuse, now poor planning is not a real excuse, but if you have an emergency or something happens, get to court, get to work, get to the drug screen, I'd much rather you jump in a ride sharing service than fail to appear because again, it just sets you back further and further and further. Job planning, it's very difficult, even with the relationships we've developed with the community, uh, to do this one-to-one -one job pairing. So we're about to prop up a, an electronic online database um, job board so that the folks who are willing to hire can post uh, job offerings and they can post their resumes and we can actually do the job pair. And we can actually do video conferencing at Angola Prison if the employer so chose to do an interview before they even come back out. So 
And can I just jump before you, Alex? One other thing that I'm really proud of in this program, um, peer support. And so these guys and ladies have been in prison together and they develop relationships. And so when they return, we actually honor those or support those relationships as long as they're positive. Um, and so there's some ride sharing there. There's some uh, calling in the middle of the night. I'm thinking about using and talking them through, saying, you don't want to do that. You don't really want to do that, do you? So peer support has been something that has been supported by most departments of corrections. Uh, it's supported by ours to the extent that it's positive. And that is monitored by the intensive probation officers that we have. Uh, and so we're really, really proud of that also. Awesome, thanks. Project, what did you hope to achieve and where are you at this juncture? Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I sort of alluded to earlier, it was, it was really trying to understand why there are so many people in, in jails and prisons uh, and what are things that were actually, to some extent, easier to fix. And, and, and we really focused in on technical violations. And one of the first places we start was on the pretrial process, you know, helping people show up to court. Um, and we, we actually, you know, it sounds crazy, but it's pretty normal. We just talked to people who missed court and asked what happened, right? And it's like, you know, and, and then we tried to match that to make sure it, we understood it. Because I think one of the things you need to do if you're trying to solve a problem is get proximate to it. And uh, luckily, or, or maybe it's my own volition, probably my parents, I'm not just a system involved. And you know, I didn't know exactly all the things sure. that were going on. And so um, you know, for us, it was like, I didn't get the reminder. Why didn't someone get the reminder? <laughs> you know, oh wow, if you read a lot of literature on housing in this country with low income individuals, they're moving around several times a year. So if you're gonna send a letter, not gonna get there. Uh, forgetfulness. Um, there's a great book uh, by two behavioral scientists called Scarcity, and it actually talks about cognitive loads and bandwidth taxes. And you think about like when someone comes into a courtroom and says, I forgot, I originally was like, that's crazy. Who would forget a court appointment? That's the most important thing ever. But meanwhile, you think about if someone's trying to figure out housing, health care for themselves or their children, trying to put food on the table, they literally may forget. Um, things like child care, rides to court. And we basically just tried to think through, well, the crazy thing about these issues is these are solvable, right? We can do a better job reminding folks. We can do a better job supporting them. I can't, I can't change the education system in this country. I can't change redistricting, but I can make sure someone's reminded of something if they have a phone. And so for that, we just said, okay, well, how would we do this? We, we built a software system built on text messages um, we thought about how people felt dehumanized by the process. You know, we said, well, let's operate the system inside of a public defender's office because that will be someone who is a trusted voice to collect this phone number. I mean, this is one of the things, hopefully people get away from this. Like technology, sometimes it's technology, a lot of times it's process. It's just thinking through how people think and operate. The fact that we cited a reminder system in the public defender's office instead of the prosecutor's office, that's that has nothing to do with technology, you know? But, but that's, I think, been a real driver of our impact. Um, and so, yeah, so that's sort of how we did it. We, you know, uh, for people who are working in county or state or local government, you know, what was really lucky, we had these ideas. Um, someone connected us to a public defender chief in California, said, oh, this, they would be interested in trying something out. And, you know, because it's a chicken or the egg thing. If you're ever trying something new, someone's got to be first. And, you know, for us, someone said, yeah, we know you have zero track record, but you seem like nice enough people, and, and we'll try you out in a small pilot. And, you know, and we had really good results. And from there, it's about just trying to grow and grow and grow, because, you know, some people will say, oh, this is surprising, you have good results. But it's really not. Everyone here knows. People aren't fleeing. When most people don't show up or don't comply with things, you know they didn't, generally speaking, you know, go to France, you know, this is not episodes of Law and Order. So, uh, um, so yeah, so that's sort of how we started and, and where we went from. You know, our most successful sites have failure to appear rates of around four and a half to 5%. Um, some other sites that are more recent are around eight or 9%. Um, but most of these places started with failure to appear rates of, you know, about 20%, 15% in some jurisdictions. So we're seeing a, a 50 plus percent decrease in failure to appears, um, which as I said, somewhat surprising, but then uh, we're talking to folks right now, and I think it's um, Jefferson County, Alabama, and a lot of people aren't getting any reminder um, for court. And so one of these things where it's like, you know, how do you get a really massive improvement? Well, if you're not reminding people at all, or you're just giving them a piece of paper and saying, show up in 30 days, and they lose it when they walk out the door, you know, uh, that's, I think, why we're seeing a lot more successes. 
Wonderful. So let's talk about, we've talked about successes, let's talk about challenges and resistance. Um, so, so Alex, when you first started doing this work, you mentioned, you touched on sort of the resistance from the kids being like, all right, but this isn't cool, right? But what other challenges and resistance did you find along the way, and how did you overcome it, or have you been able to overcome it? Yeah, so uh, a lot, and in many dimensions. You know, I think that something that we recognize is that uh, within any criminal justice system, you have a lot of stakeholders who maybe disagree on a lot of different things, and when you're trying to build a comprehensive system or things that can help people, um, you're going to have disagreement about who wants to implement it, who wants to fund it. Uh, you'll even have challenges about whether or not the population that you're trying to serve is willing to take it up. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're sitting at this really weird place right now where um, I think a lot of us would love to be able to leverage the, the phones that people have in their pockets because we recognize that it's with them all the time. And as a, as a behavioral scientist, you know, I see that as a really wonderful delivery channel because it's just something that's constant and I know that I can build an interface around the types of nudges that I'd like to be able to, to construct for folks using that kind of platform. Um, but what we run into is the fact that it leverages an ongoing uh, flow of data. That data can be used to, uh, against the folks who I'm trying to help. And if I'm a, a reentry coordinator, of course, I'm not necessarily going to use that improperly. But I can tell you that whenever I talk to a DA's office um, or probation and parole, depending on the jurisdiction that I'm in, uh, they may ask whether or not I can give them the tracking information. Uh, because to them, that's valuable. Um, but I think that it's, it stems from a bigger challenge, which is something that I, I think is really important, which is recognizing that you know, we're, we're living in an environment where um, we, we would like to try a lot of stuff, uh, but a lot of these systems are not well set up for empirical investigation. Um, policy is made from a philosophical perspective in a lot of respects and not necessarily from a perspective that's based on evidence and outcomes. Um, and until we can get to a system that looks closer to one that looks experimental, I think that we're going to constantly be running into um, pushback from folks about ideas um, because we're, we're not in a position to be able to evaluate them reasonably and to be able to produce results uh, that look good on paper, but maybe we're not in line with the philosophy of those individuals. So um, one example of that, I guess, is, is simply saying that uh, there was this wonderful analysis by a researcher, Jennifer Doliak. Uh, at Brookings, uh, which looked at, it was a meta-analysis looking at um, supervisory levels of uh, various types of populations. And the big takeaway was that less supervision for lower risk individuals generally leads to better outcomes. I can promise you if you go around the country and ask parole or probation departments or corrections departments, um, they're not going to adhere to that philosophy or they're not going to look at the evidence and say that sounds right. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to test ideas that can support people um, that are more automated uh, that don't require the same level of oversight from, uh, from the corrections departments or from probation and parole that are going to lead to better outcomes um, and, and be less uh, impunitive and, and less sort of problematic for the folks that we're, we're, we're supervising. Um, potentially more autonomy is maybe a good thing um, if facilitated well. Um, but I think that e if facilitated well is sort of where technology might be able to come in and help a lot. Linda and uh, Judge, what, what are some of the challenges that you faced in uh, trying to move these programs forward? And do you continue to face resistance, maybe from you know different parties who think you're being too soft on crime, too hard on crime? I don't know. Not sure. What are your thoughts on that? So one of the biggest um, challenges or points of resistance has been with employers. Um, and so um, even before I was hired, Judge Schlegel was taking busloads of employers up to Angola to see um, the place where people are be learning their skill set and um, to have big companies and small companies to say, yes, I'm excited about this and yes, I will hire and call them when it's time for a person to return. They say, no, not yet. <laughs> um, so that's been disappointing, but um, we're finding that we have to continue to educate the uh, public about the program and continue to educate employers. Um, our program in particular is considered to be one of the hardest of the five pilot programs because the judicial review and oversight um, where they're required to be in court and they're required to do substance abuse treat, um, testing and to meet with me once a week. And so some employers have said that we don't want to babysit, we just want somebody to come to work and work. Um, so employment is a big issue. The other one would be in the area of housing. And so persons who don't have families to return to um, 
having a place to stay once they return. So great model across the country is Oxford House Recovery Houses. And so we've been able to use that one as a way to get people housed. Um, so, um, and then one other thing within the Department of Correction, uh, we have two intensive probation officers. And in the state of Louisiana, probation officers tend to have a caseload of 140 or more, which is, doesn't work for our program. So uh, caseload reduction. And so a little pushback with that, but we're finally getting the numbers down to what we need them to be so that they can do the intensive supervisions. I think our challenges are, are, as she said, very similar. We have a good fortune. We have a, a great bench, uh, our DA, our sheriff, uh, local public defender's office, everybody really works together. So we haven't really had much pushback in, the sen in that sense. Obviously, everybody's going to have their own positions, but um, from the standpoint, I mean, we've been able to create these programs. We have a DA assigned to us. We have a public defender assigned to us. We have two PMP officers assigned to us. So everybody's really uh, come together to try and address these situations. And again, we just have all these you know, money limitations, um, resource limitations, how do you scale and expand from that point forward? How do you take these pilots um, and really change the entire uh, criminal justice system? It's, you know, I always say it's a 20-year project. It's not a two-year project. It's not going to happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight. And so just doing something every single day um, over and over and over for years and years and years, um, I mean, that's how you get it done. Uh, I heard you get the award. Uh, congratulations. And, you know, I'm sure it took 30 years, you know, to, to do what you've accomplished. It's just doing something every single day until it's done. Sure. Um, I guess, like, you know, not surprisingly, the biggest challenge um, is getting counties, you know, or states to buy in with something new. And I'd say that's like there's sort of two sub issues. Uh, one is obviously budget, right? Like things cost money. Uh, even if they generate cost savings in the form of less people going to jail, uh, government doesn't always think that way. Um, and I guess the second piece is just like getting people to think about, you know, what are you trying to solve for instead of checking the box. Um, there's an anecdote of a very, very large city in the middle of the country um, that said, oh, wow, we want to do text reminders. And I was like, okay, this is what we do. And so, oh, no, no, we're going to go about it our own way. We're going to send reminders out from the court clerk, and we're going to spend over a million dollars. And by the way, this is what it looks like, and you have to have an email address to sign yourself up for it. <laughs> and a lot of people we speak to don't have email addresses. And so uh, it's just getting you know government, I think, to think about, you know, do they have budget? Can they invest in savings? But also to think about how do the people going through the programs think to make a system that's as easy for them. <laughs> so let's play devil's advocate for a second. Right? So why are we, and I know, Linda, you hate this the term coddling, but why are we coddling people in the system? I mean, isn't there some form of self-determination and self-responsibility and, you know, you're supposed to write it down in your calendar when you have a court date and, and things like that. What, what do you say to that argument? <laughs> Alex is like, I've yeah. got something. <laughs> well, it's actually something the judge said earlier. Um, judge, you said poor planning is not an excuse. You know, and I, I, I have to disagree with you a little bit about that because I think that all of us um, sometimes forget. Sometimes we have planning fallacies. If you've ever had to deal with this, I don't know, sunk cost fallacy, this notion that if you spend a lot of money in something, you should just keep on going even if it's failing. Uh, we do this all the time. Uh, the problem, though, is that for the populations that we're trying to support, um, these small behavioral failures that are endemic to everybody have a much greater impact on their livelihoods than they do for us. And if we don't treat that, if we treat it as all equal, um, we're actually not treating, we're not meeting people where they are, um, and we're not treating their reality as something that we have to contend with as well. Um, so I think that it's, it's less coddling and it's more problem solving realistically, it's more pragmatic to recognize that we need to deal with the conditions in which people are living, meet them where they are, um, and that's how we're going to get greater success with the metrics that I hope that we're all interested in, which is lower incarceration rates, better public safety. Um, otherwise, I think that what we see is just sort of a negative externality of our beliefs. I'm still opposed to coddling <laughs> as a term. Um, and so I would still just go back to um, that it's caring and support and that I'm learning that this population hasn't always had that caring and support. It's not to say they didn't have caring people in their lives, but um, imagine having uh, the judicial system to care. That's a whole new model. And we hope to transfer that. 
So this is the second time he's disagreed with me. The first time was on our teleconference. And so I would still say poor planning. It's doubling down. Poor planning is not an excuse. The consequence should be proportional to where that person is. So I would still say poor planning is not an excuse. But that doesn't mean I revoke you because you make a poor planning choice. It has to be proportional to that individual. You don't treat a, you know, my child's 13 now. I didn't treat him when he was five the same way I treat him as he's 13. So it's still a consequence, but the consequence should be proportional to that poor planning. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we're not in Louisiana, so I can't definitely win this one. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I, I look at it, I guess, as a, uh, maybe a, some of an outsider view, where it's just, even if you want to use the term cuddling, it's a lot cheaper. I don't. To, to, it's, a, well, it's a lot. I said, well, I said, oh, fine. If you want to just care, it's a lot cheaper to care than to do the alternative. We've been doing the alternative for a long time, and it hasn't worked, and it's really expensive. And I think about it, using the judge's analogy before around health care, mm -hmm. right? Preventative care is a lot cheaper than treating, you know, if someone ends up getting sick. In this instance, when people mess up, they're going to jail and prison. And that's really expensive and it's crappy for everyone. So I just, I just don't see how it makes sense. If, if, you, if you have an empirical set of data that's saying caring is cheaper and better for the individual, like, let's do more of that. I, I just, sure. just cheaper. Uh, question. So on, on your point, I think that's like, spot on and are there any return on investment models I and mean, there's got to be return on investment models for incarceration versus non-incarceration and so i think sometimes see this sometimes people see this as like an emotional thing oh these poor but you hit the nail on the head you can go in front of a, a county commission and say hey here's your return on investment this is what it's going this is what the software costs this is what it's going to cost if this person keeps offending so People are creating now, or at least attempting to create, return on investment models for property crime because of the, you know, oh, it's nonviolent, nonviolent. Yeah, but there's a return on investment on, on dealing with property crime. Is there any model that you guys are looking at or using or can publish that can really quantify the savings? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, if by the way, all this is on smartsupervision.us, reentrycourt.com, it all goes to the same website, reentrycourt.com. So we have Loyola University doing our studies for us to do just this. Last year, uh, with just 47 of our swift and certain probation population that would have been incarcerated if this program didn't exist, we saved the state of Louisiana 188 grand, and that's just on 47 people. Um, and we had, um, out of that first two years, I don't think we had a new victim crime uh, out of it, so from a public safety and from a fiscal <coughs> responsibility. So I always like to speak in day rates because uh, day rates are what people go through. Uh, in the state of Louisiana, $25 a day, which is very low compared to most states. Probation and parole is $250 a day. How about I spend 10 to $12 a day, I get you better recidivism rates, I still save you $15 a day and still saving you millions of dollars. So we're building this model of going, all right, what's it gonna cost me for one counselor, one probation officer, to whatever that ratio of probationers and trying to work through that model and then try and build like a basic layer of at $8 a day you can do this. Unfortunately, some organizations or some counties and parishes may be a little bit more fluent. For $10 a day, you can do this. For $12 a day, you can do this and still save your, and then you can go to the county commissioner, you can go to the legislature and say, look, I'm still going to save you X amount of dollars. If you just through, think through that day rate, and that's how we've been looking through it as a day rate and trying to build that out. And again, it's a pilot. And so we're probably gonna overspend as we build. Uh, just so that we can find out what that magic number is. And so I'm working to get to that $10 day rate and maybe the probationer covers $2, P&P covers $8, the court covers two, whatever that looks like. Um, so that's what we're working on to get to that number. Yeah, I would say, you know, some of it's a work in progress, right? Because what you, what you want to be careful about is not overpromise and underliver and also have pseudoscience that then you make a mistake and then people get annoyed at it. So it's like right, but you, over time your data will yeah, get yeah. Data, it'll get replicated, it'll be reproducible, repeatable so, right. and, and so you'll be able to publish yes. and in a peer reviewed article. So it's not kind of wishful publication. It, it, but it's you know, yeah. legitimate science and there's gotta be behavioral scientists publishing like crazy on this stuff. So I mean <laughs> unfortunately we're dealing with a replication problem in the social sciences generally. Um, but I, I think that also 
is true here. I mean, there was a, a recent report that came out from Arnold that was looking at um, a, a very large uh, set of RCTs uh, that were looking at um, post-release programming and basically found no net effect across all of them. Um, it's not to say there aren't effective programs, but there aren't effective systems to do the measurement right now. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that states are not actually recording. There was a, a great report that was put out by, uh, I think, Pew recently that looked at um, basically what types of information is currently being collected about uh, revocation rates, types of revocation rates, about types of recidivism. And that's really important for us to consider if we're really going to be like, thoughtful about uh, what the total costs are. Because we have to consider not just you know, daily bed rates, for instance. We have to consider the marginal costs at, at the point of arrest for the court systems, uh, for any of the ancillary costs for administration and otherwise. And these are not generally aggregated well. So we have a very difficult time of being able to piece out what the cost effectiveness of uh, a prevention of a single type of crime, let alone an average recidivism event or revocation event. Um, we're getting there. I think that we all recognize this is something we need. Um, but it's, it's the rare occasion where you find a state or a county that's built out those systems appropriately and doing that data tracking. I mean, we even have uh, unique identifier problems within states. So uh, a single uh, prisoner identification number may not be shared between uh, prison and jail, between prison and the probation system. And so being able to track even at a per person level it becomes very, very tricky. Um, but again, we're working towards this kind of stuff. And you'll never get there because academics <laughs> want us to stay static and we're never going to stay static. <laughs> I'm going to change every single month because I see something and it's a dynamic area that, sorry, I, you're going to have to study it. And I remind way. him not to change. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have anything oh, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's in process in a few locations. You know, uh, one, we were actually, uh, uh, you live in Spokane and we work in Spokane, Washington. We were talking about one of the things we want to make sure we do is we can track the failure to appear rates, make sure we have the right estimate across the different stakeholders of the cost, and make sure there's not any other factor. I think one of the challenges as it relates to real robust academic research is, you know, it becomes so complicated to do the perfect study. It doesn't, like, I don't need to get the tenth decimal point. Right. You know what I mean? All I need to tell you, like, order magnitude. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, better than order of magnitude, but, but, but you know what in, I mean? In the ballpark to show the savings. Exactly. Because so then you layer the emotional hate. What does it cost when a victim is victimized on top of it? Yep. Actually, exactly. So we say, you know, we have one county that a failure to appear rate, they went through the stakeholders, $895 every time someone misses court. Because you got the police having to go, the public defenders, they have to visit him in jail, they have to refile everything, and they have to put him in jail for at least a night. And one of the things we're like, you know, we don't have to do crazy empirical studies to be like, if we charge $2 for a year and we can avoid 895 but you're exactly right. Sometimes it's tricky to, to have the right data on that without overstepping your bounds. And, but we'll have stuff probably in the next few months on it. So... In that same vein, all of you have been traveling and you know, working on these projects throughout the country. Um, how have different jurisdictions been responding and are they you know, interested and excited to try to make these changes or are you finding resistance again because of budgetary constraints or perceptions or anything like that? What, what are you seeing out there with regards to that and whoever wants to take it? I, I can jump in just, I mean, I, I've, it's, new, it's different every place and I can't explain it, you know? like. Um, in California, and what we sort of do as an organization is if someone doesn't have money but they want to work with us, we'll find grant funding to, to roll out our program. And in California, you've got San Bernardino County, which is one of the poorest places in the country and the poorest place in California. And they said, wow, we're going to save a ton of money on this. We care about that. We have money. Santa Barbara County, which has some of the richest people in the world, where Oprah has a house, was like, we can't do this. Can you find us a grant? And so it's, um, you know, and so, so I, I just, you know, we, we, I think we see a lot of interest, but it's, it's tough. I have no idea. I think, I think we're, we're in a, a moment of sea change where there's things that we're talking about today that people would have laughed you out of the room five or ten years ago. Even two years ago, when we were starting this, people said, no one has a cell phone. <laughs> And we were like, well, let's let's see. And fur enough, we, we track and see if people's phones stay active on the pretrial process. And even though we're dealing with the most indigent of people, you know, 80, 90% of people have a cell phone. You know, this is their lifeblood. And so you gotta sort of, we're, we're in an interesting moment where I think opinions are changing. No, it's, 
Yeah, that's right on. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland, anything to add on? I, 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 you know, it's just, again, getting people comfortable with it. So, again, everybody says I need money to do it, but literally for $750 or less, I can show you how to do it. But you'd have to understand. Someone would have to want to go and talk about it. Somebody would have to go and get everybody to adopt it um, to do that. And if you, you know, if you weren't, if you just said yes, I think if you got that right champion, the money is not the money is the issue, but it's not the issue. I mean, you could, we build everything without money, and the money will come after. All right. So, where from here? What what's the next steps in each of your projects? Where do you want to go? What do you want to create? How do you want to make it better? Or is it at like peak performance already? Like, have you have you achieved for some perfection? Because if you have, please let us know. You didn't hear the part about he changes every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start on this end. Sure. So what, what's next in your program, Jay? Sure. So, um, you know, we started out trying to, to say that no one should be in jail for, like, missing appointments or prisons for missing check-ins, right? And so our goal is to do that at scale. And what that requires is two things. So first off, when we send people reminders, we're finding out what help they need. So we remind people if they have a job to ask for time off of work. Um, connect them maybe with child care if they have child care in the community. So for us, Getting that data to use for good, it's about scale right now and getting as many sites as possible. And so, you know, we're in about 15 sites right now. By the end of next year, hopefully we'll be in 50 to 100. And that's in part because we work with certain statewide systems where we can, you know, work with many counties with a single integration. Um, what that's going to allow us to do and what we want the future to be is, you know, there's a lot of talk about risk assessments. And where they're really flawed is if you look at what I talked about before about appearance risk, right? Most people have attendance issues, not flight risk. And so what we can maybe start to do is, if we know that someone has certain needs, we can connect them to the right social service, try to address those needs, and then all of a sudden you have a system where judges and prosecutors feel a lot more comfortable releasing more people, knowing that they're going to show up and knowing all, you know, that they're not going to get into trouble. And so that's sort of the vision, right? A system that is not pre-trial supervision, but pre-trial assistance. Judge. So the Smart on Crime initiative begins from time of arrest. We haven't started the from time of arrest where that's the, the end game is from time of arrest through conclusion, whatever that means, whether it's diversion, hard labor sentence, probation, specialty court, dismissal, it doesn't matter. From time of arrest to a true needs assessment and risk assessment, plug you in with the services that you need and so that that plan can continuum of care, sequential model, go from start to finish and get through it and then continue to, to reach out to these various corporations and say, I love your tool, think through it from a criminal justice standpoint through our workflow and build that product for us. And so I've met with a number of companies that they are building that product for us. Oh, and by the way, it needs to be cost effective. You can't charge me a dollar a day. You cannot charge me, you know, a dollar a day is thirty dollars a month scaled is impossible so you know how about five dollars a month per participant for this as opposed to a dollar so just getting people to think through that you still have you know they're, they're, they're gonna have to make it uh, profitable for them but again the criminal justice system nobody has the resources and long term it's much much better to have get people healthy so there's no more victims forget about healthy, no more victims, so that we can get everything through the door, so. So I would just say, um, responding to the voices of employers um, and addressing some of those concerns in terms of how can a person be at work uh, eight hours a day and still be able to uh, fulfill their responsibilities to the court. And so we're looking at extending services um, to the evening hours, including maybe drug testing and um, some of the classes and um, things like that. So, um, increased personnel. Uh, <laughs> Get a raise. <laughs> True the, public servant, to my right. And so, I regard Judge Schlegel uh, as a great visionary, and I'm his great implementer. <laughs> And so together along with our team, we just continue to try to make it uh, better um, for the courts, better for the participant, and better for the community. Alex? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the vision that we're really working towards starts with recognizing that, that people can navigate themselves 
with some support. And what that enables then is actually the opportunity to, to do some tracking that we've never been able to do before, to actually begin to see people successfully ping-ponging through the reentry system on their, chart, on their path to recovery, and through that process, building an entire data ecosystem that can be leveraged by policymakers um, to better understand what works and what doesn't, to ask those empirical questions, to identify where there are gaps, and also to recognize where participants are putting a lot of effort in and where they may not be getting credit for that effort. So in the future, what I hope that we're really building up towards, in the same way that we're seeing the, the healthcare industry move towards uh, accountable care organizations and value-based care, that we see that this turns into a value-based criminal justice system and that we can see that the goals that we're all shooting for and that the incentives within departments and otherwise are towards positive outcomes of those that are coming out of the system or being monitored by the system. So, um, yeah, question. Not a question, but a comment. I'm Judge Burnett from Washington, D.C. And I started an experiment in D.C. where when I put a person on probation, I put them on two-stage probation, five years out, but if you accomplish certain goals, your probation shall terminate within 30 months. Give them incentives and a sense of self-responsibility. And then, in addition, bar from the family court system, review procedures to make sure the government agencies are, in fact, rendering the services. Matter of fact, when I was a magistrate judge, the district court judges say even threaten to hold the mayor in contempt of court if they do not render the services they're supposed to render. As a result of that, out of 54 judges on the court, I had the best put absence of probation revocation and people that got off probation early and the marshals and everyone else even applauded the people with, and people came in voluntarily and let me know the achievements. Now we didn't do a cost effective but the uh, director of the DC jail said that when I revoke probation and send a person to jail, it's $165 a day just for cost rate and taking care of that person. So I'm recommending that across the country where they have that flexibility to make people feel they're in charge of their own destiny. I even had a young lady who was only 90 pounds and was almost near death. I put her into an inpatient drug program followed by outpatient. About 12 months later, she came back. She weighed about 50 pounds more and was a secretary in a law firm. So the point is, Again, this was an experimental approach incorporating the review process of family court cases with an electing reviews along with incentivizing and giving persons a sense of self-control that really worked. And I think I established, of 17 years on the bench, I established a record of having the fewest probation violations in the whole court system. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Uh, so Hold that thought. Let me just add, do one closing uh, question for the panel, and then I'm going to open it up for Q&A uh, for our, our guests. So what can we as practitioners, as attorneys um, on both sides of the aisle do to amplify this work and kind of help? What can we do to help you? How can we help you? Help us help you. I have a very easy request. Um, I'm looking for probation or parole departments to do pilots with next year. If you're aware of anyone who might be interested in having a conversation, I'd be very appreciative you'd be willing to make a connection for me. Uh, so I would say uh, go to the website, um, share it, look in the handbook, tear it apart. The program handbooks are there, something you like or dislike, something that, you know, challenge it. Um, I uh, welcome anybody to Angola Prison. Come with us. December 6th is our next tour. Uh, you're more than welcome to come. Just send uh, reentrycourt.com. Go to contact us, and it'll go straight to Linda Fay. You're more than welcome to join us and see it for yourselves. Um, and I'm happy to speak anytime, anywhere. And if you have questions, just call me. Uh, I'm happy to help, uh, help, you, help you to walk through it. I'll help you build the darn website if you need help doing that, too. Um, so it truly is. Uh, just keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, I think so about Alex, you know, we're just looking for new jurisdictions to work with and collaborate with. Uh, people have thoughts. Um, the other thing, not really related to us, but just saying it's important on a technology panel, is also just be, have a fair bit of skepticism around technology. And as, as Alex was referring to around supervision, um, I think 
I've had meetings with probation departments where they've said, oh, your technology, like, can you build an app so we can do live surprise check-ins? And I was like, well, what about technical violations? Like, no, no, we want to do check-ins. And so uh, technology can be great. It can allow people to be more efficient, but can also be really bad. And with that, it can also be really expensive. And I think just a sensitivity around how the end user interacts with the technology to make sure that you don't have increased court costs. You know, people say, oh, let's have an app for this. Now we'll just charge $3 a day to people that don't have it. You know, so just be wary, which is, a, I don't want to end on a not positive note, but just uh, hopefully the Q&A will be more positive. So. <laughs> That's a cautionary. Yeah, I guess a cautionary <laughs> tale. This yeah. is cautionary. You know, I always like to, to say, look, this isn't Big Brother. We're not trying to build Big Brother. My Big Brother was a jerk. We're trying to, we're trying to beg Little Brother. The little Brothers are sweet. They try and keep you out of trouble. They're trying to help you out, you know? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, audience, uh, Phil, I know you had a question. What is the role of the prison and or the uh, jail in preparing yep. people so that when they walk out the door, it's not like, boom, it just hit them. You're kind of socializing it to them ahead of time. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so we've been thinking about this a lot. Um, uh, oftentimes, a lot of the, the pre-release programming happens within the last month that people are going to be incarcerated. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff that people could be doing in advance. And I think that um, you know our, our big philosophy here, again, is that at point of release, people have a very strong intention to identify strategies to make sure they never get back into that position again. Um, but that, that can attenuate after some period of time. And the more work that we can help people do to set up what those intentions and goals are up front and chart pathways to achieve them, and potentially through facility. I mean, if there's programming in facility that can help them out, either getting a certification, getting education otherwise, uh, mental health support, uh, those can be steps that they can take that can help build momentum once they're on the outside. So I think that if there are ways to help establish those intentions up front, help them set goals, help them to achieve some of those things while in facility, and help them to know exactly what their next steps are going to be once they're out, that's a really, really great way to begin this process. Actually, so I would say continuity of care, which is something that we do. So in the incarceration phase, um, the programming is happening. They're getting that skill set, that GED if they need it, substance abuse treatment. They're being mentored by lifers. And we send them to prison, but we don't just leave them there. We check in on them quarterly and have conversations to know how that process is going. And if something's not working out, we're going. And I say we, I and the judge and um, other parts of the teams are going regularly to check on people while they're incarcerated. And so before they're released, uh, the, first, the last 90 days, I'm in contact with the person before the person is released to see what those needs are and to connect them to services. And when they come out, they come to the courts and they come to me and we continue to connect them with services we've already identified. And all of that information is on our website so that even if they forget or lose the piece of paper that I give them, they can push a button and it's right there at their fingertips. So we walk with them all the way, all the way. Thank you. Any other comments? Other questions? Wow, okay, well, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm like, well, and. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the prosecutor, not the last word, I'm a defense lawyer. Right? <laughs> so, so it kind of, you know, all these some good, good programs, we have a pre-trial uh, pre and post-conviction in drug court in our district, federal district. What do you use by way of curriculum, right? You've got them now for a while, you know, you know, we try to do a little bit of CBT and stuff to try to do that behavioral change, right? That's, that's an uphill battle for them, and it's an uphill battle for the team because we're lawyers and judges and probation officers. We don't know should I know about you know behavior change, right? So to, to get them to come in, you know, to get the, the attention of a judge or a team, and to keep it going and to learn the new stuff is a challenge for us. Sure, make sure your case manager is a licensed professional counselor. Right? Yeah. We don't have one, right? You're a blessing. That's what we need. That's right. So MR, uh, more recognition right. therapy is the we tool that, that we're using within the prison system, and we use it as well when, we, when they come out, but we also connect them to other services uh, that are available. And what do you do about And they're being teams mentored teams? by lifers as well as uh, some other life skill components that are given while they're incarcerated and when they return. Again, we have, uh, I mean, our PNP officers are awesome. They're, they're MI trained. We have, you know, our, our, the, our public defender and our DA buy into what we're doing. So the team understands and appreciates the vision and, and applies it from an evidence-based practice. This is not willy-nilly. We're not winging it. 
you know, it's we're developing, layering, layering, and layering, and adjusting when necessary. Ashe, and we're also using a program out of Stanford University called uh, Cultivating Compassion, and we have a therapist that volunteers to come in um, every other Tuesday to work with me, but they also do that particular uh, treatment inside the prison, uh, at Angola, not at our female prison yet, but they're trying to extend it to some of the other um, prisons. So compassion cultivation out of Stanford University. Thank you. Uh, one additional comment. I've been invited by the Warden's Association for America to speak at their conference in February. And we I have and we I'm the CEO of the National African American Drug Policy Coalition. And we are advocating that six months before a person is to be released, they should establish a program. Mm -hmm for adjustment of that individual upon release and certain conditions and work up response. And we're working with black churches in America to send people in as consulate mentors so that when they walk out of prison, you know, on supervised release or on parole, we have mentors for them, like we have mentors with teenagers yep. to help them address so they do not recidivate. Mm -hmm. yep. And in uh, February, I'm supposed to address the National Convention of the wardens for the entire country on implementing that system to prevent recidivism and to make people coming out of prison feel that they are returning citizens and they're not, we say, wrongdoers for life. Yep. So we are innovating that project across the country. Now, we've not had any further say, I may want to collaborate with you because we, but one of the missions of the National is to develop design and implement programs to reduce recidivism and mass incarceration. Judge, we already have it. So we have mentors um, that we train through Wheaton College on an online program. So each person that returns to the community has a mentor. That mentor, that mentor comes to court on their first day to meet them face to face and is in contact with them weekly. Okay, so, so it's being done. <laughs> well, I believe our speakers may have a minute or two afterwards to talk to folks. So if you have opportunities for collaboration, you, you heard the call. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank and thank you to the Criminal Justice yeah, yeah, yeah. Section and the Center for Innovation. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.